Have you ever seen what an arthritic knee looks like? Well, here is a real human knee with multiple degenerative changes, the primary one being osteoarthritis. So today, I'm going to show you what's wrong with this knee, while showing you many of the cool ligaments like the ACL, the MCL, and even what's left of each meniscus. We'll also talk about what causes knee degeneration in this type of pain, and more importantly, what you can do to prevent and treat it. It's going to be a neat one. So let's do this. So let's orient you to this knee so you know exactly what you're looking at. So here we have a right knee. And why I know it's a right knee is because I've got the kneecap here, or the patella, which means this is the front or the anterior aspect of the knee. If I reflect that out of the way, you can see me tapping the femur with my thumb, so that's where the thigh would be. And then we've got the bones of the lower leg. We've got the tibia in the fibula. Now there may have been times where I've been a little obnoxious with some of my students because sometimes when they're first learning these bones they might say tibia and fibula and I'm like no 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 it's tibia and fibula la 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 because the la in fibula helps to remind you that it's the lateral bone and that's probably how the mom in Schitt's Creek would pronounce lateral. Okay well this coffee has nothing in it. Oh it's just a gesture David. Stop being so literal. But either way because we know that the fibula is the lateral bone, we can bring it over to Jeffrey. And if I put it on the left side, you can see how that wouldn't work because that fibula is on the inside. But if I move it over to the right, I've got the fibula where it needs to be, the kneecap where it needs to be, you can see how that would compare to Jeffrey. So we've got this right knee. But as a fun little FYI, did you notice what bone Jeffrey is missing in his knee? If you do, go ahead and put it in the comments. But let's take a look at some of the cool ligaments on this knee. The first ligament that we'll take a look at is the medial collateral ligament, also known as the MCL. If I can get my probe underneath there, you can see how broad and flat this ligament is. Now, this ligament is one of the more commonly injured ligaments in the knee, and it also forms an interesting relationship with the medial meniscus. Well, what's left of this particular medial meniscus, and I'll get into that in just a second. But the upper portion of this MCL will actually attach to that medial meniscus. So if you were to tear or damage the medial collateral ligament or that MCL up here, that could simultaneously tear or damage the medial meniscus as well. But let's move over to the lateral side of the knee. We've got another ligament called the LCL or the lateral collateral ligament. And you can see me tracing that with the probe there. Now if we go inside, we've got some other commonly known ligaments that you've probably heard about. The one that you've probably heard the least about actually between the two in here is the PCL. Let me probe it and then I'll show you up close on the camera there. So right at the tip of the probe is the PCL and that's actually jutting backwards like so. And PCL stands for posterior cruciate ligament. Cruciate referring to crucifix because this is for gonna form a cross with the very commonly known ligament known as the ACL. Now let me show you the ACL here. So right at the tip of the probe is the ACL and you can see that going backwards and upwards there. And that ACL, again, is a very commonly torn ligament that you hear about with people, um, often with sports injuries. Now, in a typical anatomy class, you'll often hear ligaments connect bone to bone, and that is absolutely true. But I do feel like we could go a little bit further and give ligaments a little bit more credit. I will tell my students, yes, ligaments connect bone to bone, but they also define the range of motion of a joint. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example here. And Hopefully I don't tear my own ligament by getting on a rotating chair here. I'm gonna try to be a ninja here. Okay, so what I mean by the ligaments define the range of motion of a joint, we learned four ligaments there, and essentially the ligaments of the knee say, you can go into flexion, extension, so move this way and this way, and a little bit of rotation. Whoops, as I rotate the chair and don't die there. So what I mean by this is like, let's say the MCL we've got here, that would prevent the lower leg from moving outward or going into abduction. Or what somebody might say is prevents like a valgus strain. If something pushed far enough on the outside of your knee and pushed it inward, that could potentially tear your MCL. The LCL prevents your lower leg from going inward or like adduction. Or if somebody were to put like a varus strain, which would be pushing outward, that could tear the LCL. The ACL prevents you, your lower leg from sliding forward and hyperextending, where the PCL prevents your lower leg from sliding posteriorly or backwards. And so essentially that's what we mean by define the range of motion of a joint. Those ligaments keep that joint stable, define its movements, and again, if you push too far one way or the other, 
that could tear some of those ligaments. So finally, let's take a look at what's wrong with this knee. This knee has major degenerative changes, mainly on the articular cartilage. So if we look inside here, we can see this cartilage is rough looking, not smooth, not uniform, and just blah. I guess blah is our technical term for degenerating cartilage. But when we have degenerative cartilage in the joint like this, we call it osteoarthritis. Now the nicest piece of cartilage we probably have on this knee is right here. You can see it's more glossy, smooth, and uniform. And if we had a healthy knee, just imagine this type of cartilage being more uniform up on both condyles of the femur and in between on that groove. Now, I do have a knee that has a little bit less arthritis, and so if we go over here, here's another right knee. Up here you can see the cartilage is a little bit better, smooth, smoother I should say, more uniform. But as we move down on the condyles, you can also see on this knee, it thins out and gets a little bit more arthritic. Not nearly as bad, again, as this knee. And let me see if you can actually hear this, so try to listen closely here. I'll tap right here. So we've got some cartilage there, but if I tap over here, pretty much all the way down on bone right there. So severe arthritis in this knee. Now arthritis may not only just affect the articular cartilage, it can also affect those fibral cartilage pads that we call the menisci. Menisci is just plural for meniscus. We have a medial meniscus and a lateral meniscus in the knee. But on this particular knee with severe arthritis, the meniscus is pretty much completely gone with the exception of the outer rim of it. So let me see if I can touch that for you so you can see it closely right there just that outer little rim is what's left of the meniscus here and even a little bit on the front. And if I put a picture up, you can see what a normal meniscus should actually look like, but we just have that edge or that rim left. Now, the meniscus on this knee, or the menisci, aren't much better here. You can actually see here's the medial meniscus on this particular knee. And I actually can slide it off the medial condyle of the tibia here. Watch this sliding off right there. So some wear and tear on this meniscus as well. And the menisci are extremely important for shock absorption for the knee and actually proper tracking of the knee. So what actually causes these degenerative changes in the knee? What causes the articular cartilage to start degenerating and even the meniscus creating this osteoarthritis? There are several factors that can put someone at risk for developing osteoarthritis. This includes age, joint injuries, obesity, genetics, anatomical factors, and sex. Age-related changes in joint tissues make them more susceptible to osteoarthritis, one of the many benefits of aging, I guess you could say. And joint injuries can initiate inflammatory processes that lead to degeneration of the cartilage. Obesity can add mechanical stress and can contribute to pro-inflammatory states that exacerbate arthritis, plus anatomical misalignments can also predispose certain individuals to abnormal wear and tear. For example, if someone is a little bit more bow-legged, that could put more stress and wear on the cartilage that's on the inside or medial aspect of the knee. Now, as far as the pathology of osteoarthritis or the process of how it starts, it is thought to involve a failed repair process that leads to these characteristic changes in the joint tissues and structures that we've seen in this knee today. And one of the main reasons why cartilage does not repair or heal well is that it is avascular. It doesn't have a direct blood supply. So it has to get its nutrients from surrounding tissues and the fluid inside the joint called synovial fluid, which is a slower process than say like some other tissue like muscle tissue that has a direct blood supply. The initial changes in osteoarthritis often start with the articular cartilage. This could be an injury to the articular cartilage or an injury to surrounding structures like the meniscus or an ACL tear. And if you were to zoom into cartilage and look at it from the microscopic level, you would see these cells scattered throughout this extracellular matrix, and these cells are called chondrocytes. Chondro just means cartilage, site just means cell. And in between these chondrocytes, you'd see collagen fibers scattered about, as well as these glycoproteins known as proteoglycans. And these proteoglycans attract water to the cartilage and give cartilage some of its unique features. And again, let's say you did get some damage to this articular cartilage, or to a surrounding structure like the meniscus or the ACL. This can cause a disruption in the collagen of this articular cartilage, causing the collagen to loosen, which will then allow those proteoglycans to attract even more water and swell. This actually ends up leading to further degradation or inflammation of the cartilage and eventual death of the cartilage cells. And to make matters worse, due to the cartilage breaking down, the bone beneath the cartilage that we saw earlier here, the subchondral bone, 
starts to thicken because the cartilage is no longer doing its job, which then just puts more pressure on the cartilage and even excess stress and pressure on the ligaments as well as the menisci, leading to a potential degeneration of those structures. And so we kind of get this cyclic or snowballing effect. Some people will even develop osteophytes, which is just a fancy pants name for bone spurs. And all of this can lead to synovial inflammation, which is the membrane on the inside of the joint, which then can lead to joint swelling and instability. So I know that all sounded kind of terrible, but it's not all gloom and doom because there are things that we can do to reduce our risk of developing osteoarthritis and slow its progression through various treatment strategies. Now these first set of strategies for reducing one's risk of developing knee osteoarthritis are actually the same initial strategies for those that already have arthritis. There may just be some more specific patient tweaks or nuances on how these strategies are applied depending on the severity and the current ability of that person with the osteoarthritis. And one of the first things you can do is engage in regular exercise. There are studies that have shown that quadricep muscle weakness is highly correlated with osteoarthritis of the knee. So an exercise program would include strengthening these quad muscles, but you wouldn't want to neglect the hamstrings either as these muscles cross the posterior aspect of the knee and can also provide support. You can think of this increased strength as taking pressure off the joint like a stronger muscle being a more efficient shock absorber. You would also want to maintain mobility at the joints, so including some full range of motion exercises and stretching could also assist with maintaining joint function, which we do have some videos on those topics that I'll link at the end. Now there are a few myths that we need to dispel, and the first one is osteoarthritis is sometimes referred to as the wear and tear arthritis, and this has sometimes led people to think that high volume, high impact exercise activities such as running, could lead to the development of knee osteoarthritis. However, there has been no definitive evidence to actually support that claim. And people that already have knee osteoarthritis may still actually be able to include running in their exercise routine, depending on their situation. And again, I think this is important to note because there's also this misconception that once you get osteoarthritis, exercise is going to make it worse, which is just not the case. As research has shown that exercise is safe and that low to moderate intensity exercise is not harmful for articular cartilage in people that already have knee osteoarthritis. There's much more evidence to support that your risk of arthritis goes up with what we already mentioned, age, obesity, specific types of knee injuries that we also talked about earlier, such as a meniscus tear or an ACL tear, or if that person has some anatomical misalignment issues or imbalance between the muscles. Yes, there are situations where someone can overdo it with their training, like if they continue to run on a joint injury, or maybe they never addressed a strength imbalance or an alignment and gait issue. So for all the high volume runners, it would just be wise to one, have some strength training days mixed in, two, utilize proper footwear, and three, if you think you may have an alignment or gait issue, there are specialists out there that can do a gait analysis in order to help you correct your stride and some of those anatomical misalignments. And the last thing that I want to mention with exercise for those that already have knee osteoarthritis, there are some studies that have shown that exercise can have a similar magnitude of pain reduction when compared with NSAIDs, which stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen. So might as well give the exercise a shot. Another way to help reduce the risk of developing osteoarthritis as well as to help treat it is to maintain a healthy weight. Yes, excess weight does add mechanical stress and load to the knee joint, but there's also growing evidence for a metabolic contribution to osteoarthritis because excess adipose tissue can be a source of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines being small protein molecules that get involved in various types of cell signaling, some of which are involved in inflammation. And the cytokines associated with obesity can circulate and may promote a low-grade systemic pro-inflammatory state that could contribute to the development of osteoarthritis. And this can explain why body weight is a risk factor for osteoarthritis, not only in the weight-bearing joints, such as the knee and hip, but also within the hand. Loss of at least 10% of body weight through a combination of diet and exercise has been associated with as much as a 50% reduction in pain scores in some patients who are overweight or have obesity. Supplements are another thing that people may try, and supplements are a tricky category for preventing and managing knee osteoarthritis 
because some studies do show some efficacy while others do not. Some of the more common supplements you hear about with arthritis are curcumin as well as glucosamine and chondroitin. None of these seem to be some amazing magic bullet. Curcumin is said to have potentially anti-inflammatory and analgesic properties. And there are some studies out there that showed patients experienced greater pain relief at 12 weeks using curcumin compared with placebo, but this was minimal. An issue with curcumin is that it is poorly absorbed by the gut, but there are some curcumin supplements formulated to enhance absorption and bioavailability. So if someone is going to choose to use this, they would want to choose one of those formulations. Similar results with glucosamine and chondroitin, minimal improvements, if any. And the use of these aren't technically endorsed by many professional organizations that develop these osteoarthritis treatment guidelines. But if I have a patient that really wants to try it and they are not neglecting more effective treatment strategies, glucosamine sulfate rather than glucosamine hydrochloride tends to be more effective in those studies that showed a possible improvement. Now at this point, if someone still can't manage their knee osteoarthritis, we're going to move up to medications. And usually this starts with topical medications before tablets because, for example, a topical NSAID such as diclofenac gel has a lower risk of gastrointestinal, kidney, and cardiovascular side effects than a pill or a tablet. But in moderate to severe cases of knee osteoarthritis, a patient may need to step up to a stronger oral NSAID. And someone would obviously want to discuss the specific NSAID and dosing with their healthcare provider, especially if there's going to be long-term use of this medication. For more severe cases, patient may try intra-articular injections, which is just an injection in the joint. This could include hyaluronic acid, which is a component of the synovial fluid in joints that lubricates and reduces friction within the joint. So the idea is that injecting more of this could potentially help. However, this also has conflicting evidence on its effectiveness. It also tends to be expensive and there can be a risk of infection with any type of joint injection. Corticosteroids can also be injected into the knee. These can relieve pain in the short term, so there are cases where it may make sense to use a steroid injection to get someone out of acute pain, as these steroids can reduce swelling and inflammation. But frequent and long-term use of corticosteroids may accelerate joint deterioration, so probably not a good long-term solution. Beyond this, we move to surgical options, such as arthroscopic surgery to possibly try to clean up the cartilage, all the way up to something like a knee replacement. And as much as I would love to naturally prevent arthritis with lifestyle modifications and avoid surgery, I have had patients that have tried everything else and were therefore candidates for certain surgical options. And luckily, many of them did have positive outcomes with these surgical treatments, such as arthroscopy, even all the way up to knee replacements. Now, obviously this is an individualized situation, but these are treatment options that people have benefited from. So hopefully being able to see the inside of a real human knee joint helped you with your understanding of arthritis. And this is one of the reasons I love the anatomy lab so much, that you do a lot of your learning by doing. It's interactive and hands-on. It's active learning. And that's why I want to introduce you to another way to learn by doing, and that's through saying thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an amazing interactive online learning platform with thousands of lessons in math, science, data analysis, programming, and even AI. And since I've been teaching anatomy for the past 18 years, I would often tell my students to try to minimize the blind memorization. Ask yourself and think about, why was this anatomical structure given this name? There was a logical reason for it. And this is also what I love about Brilliant. Brilliant helps you to build critical thinking skills through problem solving. And again, not through just blind memorization. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you're also becoming a better thinker. And currently one of my favorite brilliant lessons that's helping me to become a better thinker is exploring data visually, which helps you to brush up your skills on analyzing and interpreting data from charts and graphs, which is quite helpful when you're analyzing charts and graphs on say like research about knee osteoarthritis. So if you wanna try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org IHA or click on the link in the description you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching and supporting the channel, everyone. Please give us some feedback on what you thought about the video in the comments and what bone Jeffrey the skeleton was missing on his knees. And if you want a hint on what bone that was, we'll link a video here all about that bone. And I'll see you in the next video.